The next witness is Mr Kelleher. Cheers. Kelleher, would you be good enough to come into the witness box, please? Mr Kelleher, can I ask you whether you'd prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation? I'll be sworn. Yes, stand up then, please, Mr Kelleher. Swear the witness. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Mr. Kelleher, do sit down. <coughs> yes, Mr. Peters. Mr. Thank Peters, you. just before you begin, Mr. Kelleher uh, has uh, various folders there. Are they his statements or someone else's? Uh, they should be his statements, Your Honour. I was yes. going to tender them. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I, I'm just I'm, not sure that they are. Perhaps, not, perhaps what's there can be removed, uh, yeah. Commissioner, and we can give him his statement. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, Mr Peters. Uh, Mr Kelleher, is your full name Christopher Kelleher? Yes. And is your current business address Level 6, 161 Collins Street, Melbourne. Yes, it is. And are you the Managing Director of IWF Holdings Limited? I am. And have you held that position since May 2009? Yes. And you appear today in answer to a summons dated 30 July 2018? Yes. I tender that, Commissioner. The summons to Mr Kelleher will be Exhibit 5.114. Now, Mr Kelleher, have two witness statements been prepared for you? Yes, they have. Do you have the witness statement in respect of rubric 5-19? Yes, I do. Um, and is that dated uh, 26 July 2018? Yes, it is. And... Um, uh, do you have the annexures and exhibits to that statement in the bundle with you? Yes. And is the statement true and correct? Yes, it is. I tender that, Commissioner. The witness statement of Mr Kelleher relating to rubric 5-19, uh, dated 26 July 18, together with its annexures, is exhibit 5.115. In respect of rubric 5-58, do you have a statement dated 26 July 2018 there? Yes, I do. Together with the annexures and exhibits? Uh, yes, yes, I do. And is that statement true and correct? Yes, it is. I tend to that, Commissioner. The witness statement of Mr Kelleher concerning rubric 5-58, uh, dated 26 July 18, together with its annexures, exhibit 5.116. Thank you, Mr Thank Kelleher. Thank Mr Peters. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Kelleher, you've been the Managing Director of IWF since... May of 2009? Yeah, I believe so. And you also, or you were the managing director of Questor since the 25th of October 2006? Yes, that's correct. And you were previously the managing director of Australian Wealth Management Limited? Yes, that's correct. Between 2006 and May 2009? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, without going into detail. Yeah, I, I believe so. And Australian Wealth Management then merged into IWF? Yes, yes, it was a, a three-way merger. And then you became the managing director for the entire group entity? Yes, that's correct. And you also sit on the board of IML? Uh, yes, I do. And IML is 
both an RSE licensee and also a responsible entity for various managed investment schemes? Yes, it is. And similarly, in respect of Questor, does Questor, has it been wound up now or is it still existing? Um, it's non-operational. I couldn't tell you whether it's been wound up or not, but it's non-operational. Questor also had the same type of structure, that is, it was both an RSE licensee and an RE of, response, of managed investment schemes. Yeah, on or around sort of 2009 and 10, this was the standard structure for these sorts of uh, uh, enterprises. And the Questor structure no longer exists because, as you've said, it's not operational anymore? No, no. It, uh, well, I, I think that uh, when the companies were brought together, then, then you had uh, two of identical structures and therefore you know, the long-term benefit would be to uh, integrate them. The managed investment schemes being operated by Questor effectively moved over to IMOL? Uh, yeah, fundamentally, yeah. There was a successor fund transfer. And that, well, that's, I think that's not for the managed investment schemes. That's for the... Uh, was that for the... That's for the, the RSC, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. For the actual superannuation. <laughs> yeah. Right. And APRA, for some years, has been expressing agitation about the governance structures and arrangements at IOOF? Um, we, we have a dialogue with APRA. Um, it, it's active, it's robust. Since at least late 2015, APRA has been expressing particular concerns? Um, as I said, we, we have a dialogue with them. They raise concerns, we, uh, we respond. We, we have a, a robust dialogue. And APRA... Mr Kelleher, do I take the answer to be yes? Uh, yes. Commissioner. And APRA has been insisting that, or has said that its minimum requirements are now that the dual structure, that is that EMIL is both the registered, en registered entity for the managed investment, or the responsible entity for the managed investment schemes, and also the RSE licensee be dissolved? Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the, their uh, aspiration, yeah. And that was something that was considered at a board meeting last week by IFL? Yes, it was. And I think we sent a notice seeking production of any minutes or draft minutes of that meeting, and we're told there weren't any last week. But then we sent another no You're not aware of that? No, I'm not. And then we sent another notice seeking production of any notes that had been made of that meeting, and we got something like we got some handwritten notes. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I take it the board meetings of IOOF aren't recorded? In a, that is, is there audio recording? No, no, sorry, okay. yes. So there... There's minutes are taken. And who takes the minutes? Company secretary. Okay. So could you just tell us if we bring up IFL.0048.0001.0001 Yes. <laughs> We're just trying to figure out what are the handwritten minutes taken by the company secretary. It doesn't seem like this first page are the handwritten minutes. Uh, no, no, that, well, gee, I'm not a handwriting expert. I suspect that we normally have a closed session which excludes the, the company secretary. Um, and therefore, these may be the, the personal notations of uh, the chairman. Okay. But, but I'm, I can't tell you any further than that. Do you take notes no. at board meetings? Okay. Oh, well, I, you know, I, n nothing that, that would be of any interest. And then can we, <coughs> can we go to... <laughs> we... <laughs> No, and I scribble if that's the... I mean, I scribble if, uh, well, if that's Well, the notice the... to produce was issued, Mr Kelleher. Has it been answered? Yes, it has. Uh, any notes that you've taken have been provided to us? Is that I right? took no notes. You took no notes at that meeting? Yes. All right. And then if we go to page dot zero zero three, I'm sorry, dot triple zero three. Yes. We 
would this be the handwritten minutes? I, I couldn't tell you. It, 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 it possibly could be. It, it looks like the handwriting of our company secretary, but I couldn't. You couldn't say? Uh, that's not my field of expertise, no. But it, but it looks likely. Do you eventually see some minutes when somebody types them up and sends yes, them around to you? Yes. Do you regard it as common practice in this day and age for the minutes of a publicly listed company to be taken by a company secretary handwriting them? Um, it's, it's been our practice. I can't uh, pass an opinion about what others do, but that's our practice. And the, the drafts are, are circulated to members, firstly to the chairman uh, and then to uh, other members of the board. Uh, and, and question, is that an accurate reflection of uh, events? Then if we bring up IFL.0049.0001.0003. These seem to be... That's upside down. I can see that. <laughs> These are some other notes, although that seems to be about your KPIs. Yes. So th these are or are not your notes? They're not my notes. Okay, they're somebody else's notes. Yes. All right. And then the next note that we got was... IFL.0049.0001.0004. I'm assuming those aren't your notes. No, they're not. And you don't know whose notes they are. No, I don't. And then IFL.0049.0001.0005. Again, just to confirm, those aren't your notes? No, they're not my notes. And you don't know whose notes they are? No, no. What was actually resolved at the meeting in terms of addressing APRA's minimum requirements? From, uh, from my recollection, the, uh, the resolve was that we would change the board structure of the RSE in the first, pla in the first instance, and we would uh, appoint an independent chairman um, I would step down from that board. Um, we would uh, add a, a further, an independent chairman. Uh, our chairman would continue, but not as chairman. Um, we would add another independent uh, director uh, that would possibly come from the ANZ transaction that, that's foreshadowed. So it would be entirely independent from, from its current structure. Um, furthermore, we resolved that we would investigate separating the RSE and the RE and, and, and there, there are some, some tax complications that, that could be uh, encountered on that. And, and uh, thought was given that, to the fact that we would wait till we completed the ANZ transaction and, and then potentially pick up an RE structure that was separate to the RSE structure, which would be then in, in full compliance with uh, APRA's concerns. With the requirements that APRA has yeah. imposed. Yes. And was that a recognition by the board that APRA's concerns were valid? Um, yes. The, the, uh, yeah. And that there were governance issues with respect to IOOF that needed to be addressed? No, 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 I don't agree with that. And in relation to the splitting of the RSE and the RE, was there a recognition at the board level or at the board meeting that there were problems with that DRE structure? Um, no, I, I think there was just a, a desire. It, it, it's a matter of indifference. These structures had, had evolved over time and, and were sort of de rigueur 10 years ago. Maybe they, were, they, they weren't appropriate any further. And uh, so I, I guess in the, in the current environment, uh, it was seen as that that was the preferred structure. Um, we really don't have any, any particular barrier to push in that. There are two different ideas here and I just want to understand where the IOOF board has landed mm -hmm. on these ideas. One idea is that IOOF recognises 
that there are legitimate governance concerns about the structures that it has had in place for some years. And having recognised those concerns, it is going to move to change the structures. And the other idea is it doesn't think that there are any concern, there are any legitimate concerns, but in, to use your words, the current environment where there's criticism of retail funds and financial advice providers and APRA is expressing a lot of concerns, it's just easier to make these changes. I would adopt the latter. Yes, you don't share the view of APRA that there are legitimate concerns about these structures. It's just ultimately as a matter of practicality, it's easier to make the changes rather than having to keep dealing with the complaints. Um, yes. And you've given a witness statement in relation to some events concerning the Questor Cash Management Trust. Yes. And when you reflect on those events, does that cause you to think that there might be some issues with the structure of one company being both the RSE of a lic the RSE licensee and also the responsible entity for a managed investment scheme? No, I, I don't. Do you see any issues at all with the way in which Questor dealt with the CMT issue? I think if the overarching aspiration is to, is to make sure that any member affected by the overdistribution in the Questor case is addressed, then, then no. That is, ultimately, the members, in, the members were put back into the position they should have been? Yeah, in. that's the ultimate test, and that was the overarching belief throughout the transaction that was caused by a third-party custodian. Well, they were put back into the position they should have been in because, can I suggest, APRA intervened and raised a number of issues with Questor and IOOF as to how it was handling the issue? No, unrelated to APRA completely. OK, well, let's go through that event. Back in 2009, Questor was the RSE licensee for a superannuation fund? Yes, TPS. And it was the responsible entity for, I think I'll say, a, a managed investment scheme which was IDPS-like? Yes, correct. IDPS-like, is that the name of the managed investment scheme? No, no, scheme? no, it's the description. Descriptor. It's the type yeah, of managed I investment I understand scheme. what you mean, yeah. Yes, and IDPS is an investor-directed portfolio yes. service. Yes, And in addition, Questor was also the responsible entity for another managed investment scheme, which was the cash management fund. Correct. And that's, I think, sometimes referred to as the CMT, meaning cash management yes. trust. And the situation was that Questor, as RSE licensee of the superannuation fund, the Portfolio Service Retirement Fund, yes. had invested money into the CMT, of which it was the responsible entity. Yes. And Questor, as responsible entity of the IDPS-like, had also invested money into the CMT, of which it was the responsible entity. Yes, correct. And there was an issue in 2009, although not detected in 2009, which was that a, no, I think was it a, a term deposit became due and was treated rather than as an asset as income? I, I, I'm not specifically sure about the, about the actual, the, the, the cause of the problem. On, we, uh, we obviously inherited, when we uh, merged with uh, AWM, the, the, the Questor business structure. And uh, part of their custodian arrangements were with NAS. And uh, our pre-existing custodian outside of that transaction was uh, BNP. 
and in order to sort of unify, we transferred the NAS to BMP, and in the course of that, it was detected that the, that um, there was a, uh, an overdistribution had taken place. Well, I just want to, so that the commissioner can get the picture of what had occurred. You referred to an overdistribution. That was because something that should have been recorded as an asset got recorded as income. I, I think so, something like that. I, I know it more as a, it was effectively an overdistribution. All right, you're not sure of exactly why it was that the overdistribution no, occurred. No. But in any event, an overdistribution occurred. Yes. Yes. And that occurred in 2009. Yes. And that occurred because neither the custodian nor Questor had identified that I'd suggest this was an asset rather than income. Um, the custodian didn't recognise. Not well, Questor, Questor also didn't recognise it, did it? Well, that wasn't its function. But what do you mean it wasn't its function? It, well, the custodian has the function of keeping a custody in a register of the assets. Yes. So if, if it didn't keep an accurate register, I mean, yes. Questor, Questor appoints it. Um, I see. As far as you're concerned, that's not Questor's fault. Uh, strictly speaking, no. It's a, if you appoint a custodian and they fail to, to accurately uh, complete their task. But... but you know. When you, just so I can understand, when you say strictly speaking, you accept that there's an argument that Questor also failed in respect of the overdistribution? No, but... You don't accept that? No. You don't think it's arguable that there was a problem for Questor? No, I, you appoint a custodian and uh, you expect them to act uh, accurately. You don't think that it could be argued that Questor as the responsible entity may have been able to provide a greater level of oversight? Uh, I think it, with the benefit of hindsight, may, maybe you might have done things differently, but, but arguably, if you, you contract a, a custodian to act, your expectation is they will act accurately and report accurately. Can That's just... not what occurred here. I'd just like to have a look at your statement, which is IFL.99.0004.0001. I'm sorry, I said dot zero 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 one. I think it should be dot nine zero zero one nine. So this is your statement in response to rubric 5-508? Yes. And this is concerned with this Questor issue? Yes. And if we go to page.0028, just if we look at paragraph 52A of your statement, I just want to see if I'm understanding whether there's any difference between what you're saying here and your earlier thoughts about it, where you say, whilst it could be argued that Questor as responsible entity may have been able to provide a greater level of oversight in relation to NCS's calculations and distributions, is that something that you think is arguable? Well, I think I've offered that, that with the benefit of hindsight, you, you can reflect on these, but at the time, no. All right. And what happened then was that there was this overdistribution in 2009? Yes. Does the CMT or did the CMT make annual or quarterly distributions? Oh, I, I, I couldn't recall. Um... Okay. And then in 2011, the overdistribution was detected? Yes, yes, on the transition to BMP from NAS. Yes, it moved from one custodian to the other custodian? Yes. And the new custodian identified that there was this asset that had been treated as income. Yes, yes, we'd over-distributed to uh, unit holders. Well, what the... 
I'm not sure that's right, is it? The custodian didn't identify the overdistribution. The custodian identified that there was an asset that was missing. Sorry, yes. That's right? Yes. And then that then caused Questor to try to figure out what had happened to that asset. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Again, just because it's being recorded, you'll need to say yes. Sorry, yes. Than, uh -huh. no. And when Questor investigated, it realised that this asset had been mistakenly recorded as income and that it had distributed it to the then unit holders. Yes, yes, that's right. And what Questor then did in 2011 was to reduce the distributions to be made over the next three years. Yes. And who did it tell that it was doing that? Who did it tell? I'm not sure, uh, um, meaning, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Did it say to the unit holders? No, no, it didn't, sorry. All right. It, it just commenced a, uh, a program to dilute the distributions. Yes, and just so we are clear on what that means. Yes. Rather than Questor as responsible entity of the CMT making the distributions back to the superannuation fund and the IDPS like that it ought to have been making, it instead decided to dilute the distributions to recover the over-distribution it had yes, made. Yes, yes, to restore the position. So it didn't need to tell Questor as RSE licensee or Questor as responsible entity of the IDPS like that he was doing this because it's all Questor? No, I'm not sure it formed that view. But it didn't tell the members of the superannuation fund who had their assets invested in the cash management trust? It didn't tell the members, no. And it didn't tell the investors who had their money invested through the IDPS like? No, no. That it had diluted no. the distribution? No. And then at some point in time, an issue was raised about this? Yes. And at that point, Questor gave notice of a breach to ASIC? Yes. And that, I think, was about 2012? Yes, I, I believe so. And did it give notice to APRA? No. Sorry, it, did, it gave no notice to APRA as to what? No, the RE operates under, under uh, the uh, ASIC jurisdiction. I see. So, therefore... As RE is the same team, sorry. It acts under uh, ASIC. Yes, it has so many hats, we've got to be clear about which hat it's wearing at one time. So, thank you for that. So, in 2012, it gives notice to ASIC, and I think you've exhibited that to your statement. Well, you may not, but in any event, I have it. Can we bring up IFL.0029.0001.1180? It is exhibited to the state. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, it's tab 15. So this is the notification of breach given to ASIC. Yes. And we see what's identified is the breach occurred in May of 2009. Which yes. Presumably was when the overdistribution was made. I believe so. And then the licensee, which is Questor's responsible entity for the CMT, became aware of the breach or likely became aware of the breach in February of 2010. Yes. And then if we go over the page to page dot one one eight four we see the notice to ASIC is signed on the third of October two thousand and twelve. Yes. And that's signed by Thomas Robertson. He's yes. the head of compliance, is that right? Yes. And would the board of Questor have resolved to give this notice to ASIC? Um, no, no, I, I would think normal practice would be that, that it would come from the compliance head. But how is the decision made as to whether it's a significant breach to be notified? Um, 
Well, I'm not sure I recall, but, but what is the process and how? Um, well, it's normally a, a conversation that, that, that percolates up from the head of compliance to the general counsel. If any forms of view that, that it's a it's a matter that needs to be reported. Does IWF have a breach review committee? Um, yeah, I believe it does. Do you sit on it? No, I don't. Do you know who constitutes it? Um, general counsel, at, at least. Um, we you try and to, to distinguish ourselves from from the risk and compliance committee deliberately. I'm sorry, you try and what? We have a, a structure on the main board of holdings where we have a risk and compliance committee that, that, that I don't sit on. I see. So that matters of, of this sort of nature I have no, uh, no involvement with. Do you find out, though, about significant breaches? Uh, yes. How do you find out? Well, the general counsel will advise me. Is there some formal reporting to you about it? Um, not that I could point to. But it, it, it occurs, but I, I couldn't talk to a, a formal... Is it a matter of indifference to you? No, not. No, it's not. Is it important to you that it be reported to you what significant breaches have occurred yes, within yes, the organisation? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So doing the best you can for us, tell us what the structure is by which those breaches get reported to you. The breach would be uh, reported to me by general counsel. That's the structure. Is there a regular reporting? Yes, there is. How often is the reporting done? Well, no, no less frequently than monthly. Does he send you a document? No, no. He just calls you up? He reports to me, yeah. He comes and meets with you? Yes. And says these are the significant breaches yes. we've notified in the yes. last month? Yes. Okay. And so in relation to this breach, mm -hmm. is that how you found out about it? I, I couldn't recall going back that far. Uh, I, I, I couldn't recall. Okay. And then if we go back a page to page three of five. We see there's a description of the breach. And, uh, this, yes. and this reflects your understanding that there was this over distribution that it was detected when custody was passed from NAB to BMP, and then there was a doubt raised about the existence of an asset. Yes, that's correct. And it says the overdistribution was authorised by internal fund accounting staff at the time of the error. Again, just because it's being recorded, you'll need to say yes or no. You see that? Uh, yes, I do. And the internal, account, uh, internal fund accounting staff must be staff of Questor? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So they have authorised the over-distribution? Uh, yes, based on <laughs> false information, I, I suspect. And when you say you suspect, have you devoted much time to going back and actually figuring out why this happened? Um, look, it, it's back at 2009 and uh, I guess it's uh, within our fund accounting team. I, I guess my concern was that, it, that uh, the mistake not be repeated. But, but uh, no, no, it's not, uh, it's not something that I've uh, dealt with. Wouldn't one way of ensuring that the mistake not be repeated be to find out why the mistake happened in the first place? Um, yes. In fact, that would seem to be the only way, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, so sorry, yes, y yes, that's one way. I'm, I don't accept that it's the only way. How do you ensure that a mistake not be repeated without finding out why it happened in the first place? Well, I guess I'm alluding further to the fact that if the mistake was carried out by someone else... I see. As far as you're concerned, this was a mistake on behalf of NAB? Yes. And just to... Because we have so many acronyms so that I can make clear what's... When you're referring to NAB, you're referring to there was a particular company which was a subsidiary of the NAB group that offered custodial services. Yes, NAS. And NAS had been or was already offering custodial services to Questor at the time of the merger in 2006. That's correct. And Questor came from the entity that you had been at from t before 2006, is that right? No, no, Questor was a part of AWM. 
Oh, I see. You didn't come from AWM. No, no. I see. I'm sorry. We, 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 there's one company that precedes AWM. And then... So we inherited the structure. And then if we go to page 5 of 5.1184, this is describing what the rectification by the licensee is. Yep. And we see what's described as complete investigation and method to write off over distribution in the fund. Yes. And then review alternative methods to write back over distribution. Yes. And then preliminary analysis on new members entering funds since write off commenced. Yes. And then determine extent and nature of any compensation required. Yes. Now, as I think we've already agreed, by this stage, by October of 2012, the what's referred to as the write off of the distribution, that's already been ongoing since 2011. Yes. By reducing the yes. distribution that's paid from the CMT. Yes. And this says that there's some pre preliminary analysis being done on new members entering the fund since that, I might call it the reduction of distribution commenced. Yes. And what needs to be determined is the extent and nature of any compensation required. Yeah, that's right. And the issue that that is getting at is that the problem with what Questor was doing by reducing the distribution was that new members who were joining the CMT were being detrimentally affected? Yes. And they were not receiving what they were contractually entitled to receive? Yes. And similarly, existing members who made additional contributions to the CMT were also being detrimentally affected? Yes. And they were not receiving what they were contractually entitled to receive? Yes. And one of the issues here, can I suggest, was that Questor, as RSE licensee, allowed this to occur? No. I... You don't think that there was any issue with Questor as RSE licensee sitting by and allowing itself as responsible entity of the CMT to reduce the distributions for three years? No, I don't see, uh, I don't see that argument. Really? You can't see any reason why a trustee acting in the interests of its members wouldn't say to the responsible entity of a managed investment scheme you can't breach your contract with our members and artificially reduce the distribution. I think that's your construction. I... What part of that is my construction? Well, the, the, the words you're using, you, you, you're, you're uh, I guess, looking simply at Questor as the ROC, not Questor the IDPS. I mean, the resolution that, that we were seeking was we, we basically once the mistake was uh, identified, the, uh, the full resource w was uh, aimed at uh, restoring members, both in the ROC and the IDPS. That was the, that was the overarching uh, construct. And, and to do that, I mean, we, uh, we looked at uh, Ernst & Young to assist us. Um, we took some legal advice. Uh, yeah, I mean, our overarching aspiration was to make sure that the affected members were, were made whole with compensation for the time value of money. That was, the, uh, that was the aspiration. Now, do you say that was the aspiration in 2012? Um, yeah, that we started a, a process following that to, to, to make sure that, that uh, people were made whole. Do you say, I think to use your expression, the full resource was deployed in 2012 to make the investors and members of the superannuation fund whole? Yeah, well, it's quite a complex task because, because as you point out, there are moving members in and out of the CMT and the IDPS and the RSE. 
So once the, the unit holders are affected, it, it's, it, it's quite a challenge to, to work out a remediation plan. And uh, outside assistance was sought through Ernst & Young. Attend to that document, Commissioner. What do I do? Uh, the, uh, it's the breach report. Oh, actually, we don't need to attend to that, Commissioner. It's, it's already been exhibited yeah, to yes. Mr. Kelleher's statement. Now, when do you say that you retained Ernst and Young? Um, I, I'm, I can't recall off the top of my head, but it's in the papers. Do you think it was in 2012? I couldn't recall. But when you said the full resource was deployed, and I understood you to be saying in 2012, did that include Ernst and Young? Not at that stage, possibly, but I, I'd have to look at uh, when we engaged their letter, but, you know, an engagement letter. But when I talk about the full resource, the, the full resource of our fund accounting team. The full resource of your fund accounting team was devoted to trying to figure out what compensation needed to be paid? Was to figure out how we could, uh, how we could uh, remedy the, the position on behalf of members. Um, can we bring up IFL.0027.0001.1918? So this is the legal compliance and risk report to the board directors of Questor for the, I think it's the March 2013 meeting of the directors. Yes. And you see subparagraph B on the first page, cash management fund dis over distribution. Yes. And it says, as reported in the last board paper, we reported to ASIC on 5 October 2012 a significant breach. Yes. And I think, at least at that stage, Questor met, the Questor board met every two months. Does uh, that sound yes. right? Yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah. Certainly at least two, two monthly. Certainly what, sorry? Two monthly, sorry. And so presumably then it was reported to the board in early 2013 about this breach notice that had been given on the 5th of October 2012? Yes. And would you have known before the reporting to the Questor board about the breach notice? I believe so, but, but it's going back a, a, a fair way. I, I'm, you, we're talking about recollections now. And, and then you see ASIC had some queries that were raised. Yes. And then attached to this paper is the response of Questor. Can we go to IFL.0027.0001.1924? So this is the letter back from Questor on the 17th of January 2013. Yes. And if we go over to page two. <coughs> You see it says, Questor has determined, in subparagraph two, Questor has determined the most appropriate action is to write back the overdistribution over a three-year period. However, we are currently assessing the merits of reducing this period. Yes. So who would have been responsible for making that determination? That probably would be a, a view that would come through our fund accounting team, the head of fund accounting. You don't know who in particular was responsible? Uh, the, the gentleman at the time was uh, Mr. Rosito. So it's likely that it was Mr. Rosito who made the decision, or are you just not sure? Well, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe he would have been part of the, the decision making, yes. But they've consulted you on the decision? Uh, yes. Did you but agree but the, with... Sorry, but the science of the remediation would have come from them. No, you see, and this is what we need to be very careful about, is distinguishing what we mean by remediation. This is not remediation to the members, this is reducing the distribution being made by the CMT 
because it has distributed more of its assets than it ought to have. You agree? Yes. This is about Questor as responsible, responsible entity of the CMT restoring itself. Yes. So I just want to be clear about that determination. That's a determination that you think would have lay with who? With our fund accounting team. Okay. And I think we've agreed already that reducing the distribution is a breach of contract? Um, I, I haven't agreed with that. Uh, I, I don't think I'm qualified to, to make that assessment, but... Did you ever consider whether there was a legal entitlement to reduce the distribution? I, I couldn't recall it, uh, it, it now, that the, the determination was then. I'm sorry, say that again. I, couldn't I can't recall now what my mind was then in relation to that matter. Have you ever investigated whether anybody determined whether it was legal to reduce the distribution? I would think that we would discuss it, once again, this is nearly 10 years ago, I would think that we would have discussed it um, with our fund accounting team, with our CFO, with our general counsel, and, and therefore there would be an assumption that, that the action we were taking was appropriate. But I, I can't recall specifically. Can we just be clear about this? What we're talking about here is a report at the beginning of 2013. That's five and a half years ago, and the issue keeps going after that. Do you agree? Yes. It's not nearly 10 years ago. No, the, 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 the overdistribution was. The overdistribution occurred in 2009. Yes. But we're talking about what happened commencing from 2011, which is reducing the distribution in order to restore the trust assets. Yes. So that commenced in 2011. You then came to consider it at a board level in early 2013. Mm -hmm. It had already started by then? Yes. It had been going for at least 18 months by then, or about 18 yes. months by then? Yes. Did anyone ever say to you that you can recall, we are entitled to reduce the distribution? No. No, I can't recall. Is that something that concerns you? Um, the, the over-distribution full stop uh, concerns me, but, you know, it was, uh, as, as a quantum value, our auditors regarded it as immaterial, but, but you know, the, the, the proposition that, that, it, that it occurred concerns me, yes. You see then subparagraph three is Questor has determined that on a see-through basis compensation will be required to be paid to any new investors entering the Portfolio Service Retirement Fund and the Portfolio Service Personal Income Plan who received a diluted distribution resulting from the scheme's write-off. The yes. nature of the compensation to affected, customer, to affected members will be made as a good value claim and will be funded by Questor. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yes. Yes. Now, that didn't happen, did it? Um, no. That is, it wasn't funded by Questor? No. And when, you, when it says here, the nature of the compensation to affected members will be made as a good value claim, did you understand that there are investigations underway at the time as to what compensation needed to be paid? Um, I, I presume so, but I, I can't rec uh, specifically recall. Was it a matter of concern to ensure as soon as possible that the members who were being detrimentally affected were compensated? Yes. And did you receive reporting then as to what was going on with the progress of determining what compensation needed to be paid by Questor? Yes. And how did you receive that reporting? Well, either oral or written, uh, reports to the board. And when do you recall it being reported to you that the investors to be compensated had been identified and compensation had commenced? Sorry, when did you, you say recall when? 
Yes. Oh, look, I, I don't recall specifically the date. Now, do you recall an incident with a whistleblower at the end of 2013? Uh, yes. And do you recall, we'll bring up, IFL.0027.0001.2325. Well, that's coming up. Should the uh, legal and compliance. Yes, Commissioner, thank you. Legal compliance and risk report for March 2013 meeting, Quest or Board, IFL 0027001918, Exhibit 5.117. And do you recall what was raised by a whistleblower about the Questor over-distribution? No, no, not specifically, but, but I recall that there was a, a reference to a matter about an over-distribution. But, but that, that's as much detail as I recall. Do you recall that the whistleblower was raising an issue about the reduction in distributions that was occurring? Yes and that nobody knew about the reduction in distributions? No, I, I don't recall that, that aspect of it, but, but certainly that there was a reduction in distributions. If we, so this is the papers for the board meeting to occur of Questor on the 28th of October, 2013? Yes. And then one of those papers is another legal compliance and risk report. Mm -hmm. Can we bring up IFL.0027.0001.2354? So that should be a few pages long. You see item B, ASIC cash management fund over distribution. Yes. And then you see at the end of the second paragraph, it says in our letter to ASIC, that's the January 2013 letter, we advised of a compensation methodology to be monitored and implemented at the conclusion of the proposed write-back period of three years. Yes. And then the next paragraph says, a recent whistleblower notification has been investigated by risk and a report is being finalised in time for an update in the board meeting. Yes. It is apparent that at least the following action will be required. A, a further assessment of the impact on members and proposed compensation. The review will be brought forward instead of waiting for the three-year period to lapse to ensure the right level of exposure is identified, which takes into account the entry and exit of members and the amount of compensation. Yes. So can I suggest to you, it hadn't been the intention of Questor, and it wasn't the case that Questor from the end of 2012 or through 2013, was attempting to identify and prepare to remediate affected customers? No, I, I disagree. I, I think we uh, were, were attempting to identify the cause and, uh, and find out a, a way to uh, remedy the, the position for, for members, both in the RSC and, and also in the IDPS, which we subsequently did. We restored them in whole uh, and for the time value of their money. What this paper is explicitly recording is that it was intended to wait until the end of the three-year period of under distributing before doing the assessment of the impact on members and proposed compensation. Do you agree? No. You don't agree that the words, a further assessment of the impact on members and proposed compensation this review will be brought forward instead of waiting for the three-year period to lapse, mean what they say? Well, I, I recall, and it's obviously a few years back, I think that the, the three-year period was going to be condensed to two years. Um, part of the, the challenge here was the, the party responsible for the over-distribution had been denying uh, all responsibility. Now, just think, take a moment and think whether you really want to say that the reason that there was a problem in 2013 was that the party responsible for the overdistribution, by which you mean the former custodian, mm -hmm. was denying responsibility. 
Do you really want to say that that's what was happening in 2013? Sorry, uh, in, in relation to what? Are you saying to the Commissioner that in 2013, Questor had made a claim against the custodian and the custodian was denying responsibility? Yes. All right. Did you write that claim? Did I write that claim? Yes. No, I did not. Did you meet with anybody about that? Um, mm, not that I recall, but, but obviously it would have been a, a legal claim that we were making and, and dialogue uh, that, that we'd entered into with NAS to recover. Now, do you agree with me that what these words mean on its face, on their face, is that before the whistleblower notification, it had been intended to wait until the end of the three-year period before doing the further assessment of the impact on members and proposed compensation? On the face of it, you could interpret that, yes. But when you say you could interpret it, is there some other meaning you can give to those words that you want to give? Well, well no, but it, it, it's, it, it's talking about a perspective, a further assessment, and it talks about May, you know. It might assist you if the blow-up is not only of subparagraphs A to D, but also of the chapeau to those subparagraphs, the two lines above them. Yes, okay. Yeah, I see the... You see that the, the words no, no, mean can what you, they say. Can you, can you ask your question again? Yes. What is being reported to the board mm -hmm. is to the effect that because of the whistleblower notification, there will now need to be steps taken to bring forward, instead of waiting for three years, the further assessment of the impact on members and proposed compensation? Yes, that, that, that's, a, that's a possible construction, yes. Is there some other possible construction of these words that you want to give to the Commissioner? No. All right. That's what the words mean? Yes. That's what was reported to the Board? Um, yes. That's what you understood at the time? Yes. Did it concern you that it was only because of a whistleblower notification that IOOF was now going to take steps to bring forward undertaking this assessment of compensation and the effect on members? I don't accept that, that it was the whistleblower that, that triggered the action. Commissioner, attend to that document. Uh, just the uh, report or the whole board pack? I'll it may have been done as an extract. I hope it's been done as an extract, but I'll, I think for Safety, I'll just tender the report. Second. I'll um, tender the report, Commissioner. Legal Compliance and Risk Report for Questor Board, 28 October 17. 13, uh, Commissioner. Uh, sorry? 2013. 2013, 28 October 13. Yes. Uh, IFL 0027 001 2354. Exhibit 5.118. Thank you, Commissioner. Is that a convenient time to take a short How morning long tea do you break? need, Mr Hogg? I thought if we just took a break of five minutes. I come back at shortly before five past midday. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. I'll come back at five past midday. Mr. Hyde. Thank you. Now, just so we're clear on the nature of the whistleblower report, can we bring up IFL.0006.0003.0606?
And so we see this is a, or well, the pack for the Risk and Compliance Committee in September of 2013. See that? Yes, sorry, yes. You don't, as I understood it, you were saying you don't sit on the Risk and Compliance Committee? No, I don't. Okay. And if we go to the attachment to that, which is a report which is IFL.0060.0003.0826. And so this is the report dated the 26th of September 2013. And then we go to .0831. And sorry, to zero eight three one. You'll see it saying we have received two notifications from PWC on the whistleblower hotline. Was that was PWC operating a whistleblower hotline for IWF? Yes, it was. And you see the second one is the second whistleblower disclosure report was in respect to an anonymous disclosure received via the whistleblower PO box. The allegation is that management is reducing the rate of return in respect of the cash fund of the Questor product in order to recover an earlier overdistribution to the detriment of retail investors who are not members of the fund at the time of the overdistribution. Yes. So can I suggest it's that whistleblower complaint, which is the one that's then referred to the board of Questor in October of 2013? Uh, yes, presumably. I tender that document, Commissioner. Papers for Risk and Compliance Committee meeting 26 September 13, IFL 0006 0003 0606, Exhibit 5.119. And can we then bring up IFL.0044.0006.0240? So this is a report from Mr. Riordan, who's the general counsel, to Mr. Irwin, who's the head of risk, dated the 20th of October 2013. You see that? Yes. And it's concerning the whistleblower report? Yes. Had you or have you seen this document before? Um, no, it, it, it doesn't look familiar. I mean, I guess uh, from our perspective, at all times, we tried to stay away from whistleblower, from, from my office, from a whistleblower. So effectively, it's not uh, it's not normal that I might see something like this, but but I might have a conversation with our general counsel. Now, are you sure about that? Well, it's a long time ago, so no, no, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. When you say it's normal for you to be kept away from it, wouldn't it be the case that the general counsel would? let you know either by email or by speaking to you about particular whistleblower complaints? But normally whistleblower complaints would, would uh, have their own course according to our, our whistleblower policy. They may emanate uh, and, and generate up through our risk and compliance committee. Do you recall being made aware of this whistleblower complaint by Mr Riordan before the Questor board meeting? Oh, I, I couldn't speak accurately to the timing, but you know, I'm, uh, I'm aware of it, I think. I see. Can we go then to page dot zero two four two? You see, this is the rectification plan. Yes. And you see. The first item is complete investigation and method to write off over distribution amount in the CMT. Yes. And the status as at the 17th of October 2013, it's a bit grainy, but it says no documented investigation report available by IOOF Finance. Based on discussion with key members, there appears to have been no independent verification recalculation performed to verify the $6.1 million root cause analysis of the error or any subsequent review of the procedure documentation 
approval from management. Yes. Were you aware of these matters? I'll take them in turn. First, that there had been no independent verification or recalculation performed to verify the $6.1 million? No, no, I, I guess uh, my, I had a, a working assumption that, that it was the 6.1 was the 6.1 that there had been no root cause analysis of the error or any subsequent review of the procedure documentation? My recollection was, was the, the root cause error was, was from NAS, but I can't be any more specific than that. That there was no approval from management? I, I, I'm not sure I can speak to that. I'm not familiar with it. You're not familiar with what? I'm not familiar with the, that's the first time I've seen approval from management. No, no. Were you aware that there was no approval from, from management for reducing the distribution for three years? No, no, I'm not aware that that, of, of, of that statement and that proposition. Does it concern you to learn now, almost five years later, that this reduction in the distribution from the CMT occurred without approval from management? Uh, if that were the case, most certainly. Back in 2013, did it, co did it concern you to know whether it was the case or not that this reduction in distribution had occurred with the approval of management? Yes, it, it would concern me. Back in 2013, did it concern you? Well... Uh... Did you make any inquiries to find out whether it had been approved by management? At that time, we were aware that there was a, a problem and, and we were trying to resolve it. I can't be any more specific than that. I tender that document, Commissioner. Memorandum from Head of Risk to General Counsel, 20 October 13, IFL 0044-0060240, Exhibit 5.120. What I want to suggest to you is that it was this whistleblower report that then triggered Questor taking active steps to attempt to deal with and figure out whether it would, and I'm sorry, figure out how it would remediate the detrimentally affected members. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. You said before that the problem, or a problem, was that the former custodian owned by NAB was being very difficult about paying compensation? Yes, for owning up for its error, yes. And you said that that was a difficulty that was already in existence as at 2013? Uh, I, I can't be uh, specific as to the date, but, but I'm telling you generally. Well, remember we were looking at this whistleblower report mm -hmm. And I was, I'm sorry, we were looking at the October 2013 board report and I was pointing out to you that on its face what those words meant were that as a result of the whistleblower report, it would now be necessary to actually bring forward assessing the extent of member impact and the amount of compensation. You yeah. recall that? Yeah, yes. And you recall that when I suggested to you that it was because of the whistleblower report yes that there was a trigger for mm -hmm. Questor taking steps. Mm -hmm. You said no. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties was that the custodian was being very difficult about agreeing to pay compensation. Do you recall yes. that? Yes, I do. And you recall I said to you, are you certain that this was occurring in 2013? Do you really want to say that? And you said yes. Do you recall that? Uh, yes. Can I show you a document which is IFL.0027.0001.2565. This is the papers for a meeting of the directors of Questor on the 24th of March 2014. Yes. And if we go to the legal compliance and risk report, which is IFL.0027.0001.2603. You see subparagraph B for regulatory issues, ASIC. Yes. And you see, so this is an update on what's been occurring. Do you agree? <coughs> Mr. Kelleher? 
Yeah. Do you I'm agree sorry, this is it. the update? Uh, yeah. Do you want me to read it or? No, no, read it. Sorry. It, it refers to the NAB conversation in February 14. Yes. So let's just work through it. This is reporting back to the board mm -hmm. on what internal activity has occurred in mm -hmm. relation to the cash management trust over distribution. Do you yes. agree? Yes. And the first thing it reports is that, as previously reported, internal activity is continuing and includes reducing the write-off time period presently September 2014, mm -hmm. to bring this issue to a close. Yes. And that was something that you referred to earlier, which was that at some point in time, it was decided to try to recoup the overdistribution more quickly. Uh, yes. To reduce the period from three years to two years. Yes, that's right. And then it says, further the ORFR. Now, could you tell the Commissioner what the ORFR is? Uh, it's an operating reserve policy for a super fund. The ORFR, well, just to be clear, it's the, it's the actual reserve, isn't yes. it? Yes. It's the operating risk reserve. Yes. The ORFR is established for incidents like this, open brackets, the effect on TPS RF receiving diluted distributions, close brackets, and we will consider its application once development is completed between March and June 2014. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do you know what <coughs> development is being referred to there? Sorry? Do you know what development is being referred to there? You see it says once development is completed. I, I think that might be a reference. I can't be sure, but I think the reference there is to the, uh, there was a new protocol to establish ORFRs as, as a legislative piece yes. from memory. The, there was a requirement from APRA in order to have a certain level of risk yes. reserve. Yes. And this is suggesting that once that reserve has been established to the requisite level, which will be sometime between March and June 2014, yes. then there'll be consideration given to using that to compensate members. Yes. And the ORFR is only part of the superannuation trust, yes. do you agree? Yes. It's not something that affects the IDPS-like members. No, it doesn't. And What's being suggested is that consideration will be given to using the ORFR in order to compensate the members of the superannuation trust. Yes. And do you agree that the ORFR is an asset of the trust? I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that. Uh, prima facie, yes. Surely, and you know what's coming, you must have turned your mind to the question of whose money is the ORFR? Yes, yes, I would have turned my mind to it. Because if the ORFR is an asset of the company of Questor, then Questor is using its money to compensate the members. Yeah. But if the ORFR is an asset of the trust, then Questor is causing the members to compensate themselves. Uh, yes, but um, that's not what occurred. You didn't use the ORFR? No. Now, we'll come to what you did in a moment. And then you see a meeting with the NAB to commence discussions on recouping some of the cost which can be paid into the ORFR occurred in February 2014, and we have been invited to submit a compensation claim. There is no admission of liability at this time. Yes. Can I suggest to you that the first time that Questor got in contact with the former custodian was in February of 2014? Yes, I accept that. I might have been in error earlier. You might have said something that wasn't true, is that what you mean? No, no, I might have made a mistake referring to it in 2013, that's all. Do you have any explanation you wish to offer to the Commissioner as to why Questor waited until February 2014 to get in contact with the custodian if it considered that it was the custodian's fault that there had been this overdistribution? I don't think we waited till 2014, but, but uh, you know, I wasn't involved in the, in the dialogue with um, NAS 
attended Mr. that. Mr Kelleher, what am I to make of the sentence, a meeting with the NAB to commence discussions on recouping some of the cost occurred in February 14. What am I to make of it? Sorry, that? Commissioner, I, I would accept that uh, interpretation, obviously. Well, uh, be good enough, please, to listen to the question that is asked. Yes, Mr Hodge. Do you want to offer any explanation to the Commissioner as to why Questor waited until February 2014 to make contact with the former custodian if it considered that it was the former custodian's fault that the over-distribution had been made? No, no, I, I can't, obviously. I mean, I, I think we were investigating the, the, the extent of the, the over-distribution. I'm, I'm, I'm presuming... Well, you know when we look at these documents that that's not true, don't you? You know that, in fact, you weren't investigating it and then a whistleblower report was made in October of 2013. Do you agree? No, I, I, I'm saying to you that I don't think that, that our remediation was, was sparked by the whistleblower, but no more, no less. I tend to that document, Commissioner. A quest or legal compliance and risk report for meeting of 24 March 14, IFL 0027 0012565, Exhibit 5.121. And then can we bring up IFL.0027.0001.2936? So you'll see these are the papers for a board meeting of Questor on the 27th of October 2014. Yes. And then if we go to dot two four three six which is the legal compliance and risk report. Now you see, again, item 1B, ASIC, cash management fund over distribution. And you'll see the second sentence says, Questor has since issued a demand to NAB claiming compensation in relation to the over distribution of scheme assets that occurred in May 2009. Yes. And you've exhibited that demand. If we put the board paper on one side and bring up on the other side of the screen the document, which is tab six to Mr Kelleher's statement, it's IFL.0006.0003.4038. So you see this is the demand dated the 13th of May, 2014. Yes. And you'll see the second paragraph says, our investigation into the incident was both a lengthy and thorough process and we are now in a position to report our findings to the National Australia Bank as we had undertaken to do. Yep. And then if we go over the page to page dot 4039, you'll see this is where the assertion is made that it is Questor's fault, and we see that at the bottom of the page, where it says, Questor had an expectation NCS would perform a reconciliation as part of its ongoing custodial services and advise Questor if there was any anomaly. Yes. And you see what's said in the immediately preceding paragraph is, we do acknowledge that irrespective of NCS, which is the custodian, performing a reconciliation before the distribution was made, it may have been prudent for Questor to also reconcile the shadow portfolio back to the records or to the underlying credit union offering the term deposit. Yes. I take it though, you don't accept that it would have been prudent for Questor to do so. Uh, look, when you're looking back with hindsight, yes. 
you don't accept that Questor had any duty to the mem ultimately the members of the superannuation trust to do so? Questor always has a duty to the members, but uh, you know, I, I think we're sort of getting into a technical area where I, I really don't have expertise in terms of the, the operations of a custodian specifically. And then if we go over the page to dot four zero four one. You'll see it said, although Questor does not absolve itself of its part in the, in the incident having occurred, we consider that NCS as custodian breached its duties under the agreement by failing to exercise the requisite standard of care owed to Questor as a client and also by not having in place effective internal controls that should have detected the incident. Yes. And it's then explained that the final amount of compensation will be confirmed by the 30th of June 2014, which is when the next quarterly cash account distribution will be made. Yes. So this is the demand, and what's being contemplated, if we then go back to the report, is in the second last sentence, once compensation is calculated, we will communicate to the approximately 9,000 affected members. Yes. See that? And so what was intended was that the first time that it would be communicated to the members that there had been an underdistribution was after the underdistribution had finished. Um, uh, yes. And the other point made here you'll see is that on the 4th of August 2014, NAB requested further information to calculate its share of compensation. Yes. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Legal compliance and risk report for meeting of 27 October 14, uh, AFL uh, 0027 0001 2936, Exhibit 5.122. And do you recall when it was that Ernst and Young were engaged to? conduct a data verification? I don't have that date sitting in front of me, but it's probably in my statement. I'll just bring up for you the report. So if we go to IFL.0006.0003.4008, which is tab five to Mr. Kelleher's statement. But this is the remediation assessment report that was delivered to IOOF in December of 2014. Yes. And if we go to page 2.4009, you see the engagement letter was the 22nd of August 2014. Yes. So can I suggest it wasn't until August 2014 that Questor engaged Ernst & Young to carry out an assessment of the remediation. Yes. And then at some point there was an agreement reached with the custodian that the custodian would pay for half of the amount of the compensation that needed to be paid. Is that yes. right? Yes, that's right. And that payment was then used in the first instance to refund the members of the IDPS-like scheme? Yes, that's correct. And that was in the, in the interests of the members of the IDPS-like scheme. You agree? Yes. yes. It wasn't in the interests of the members of the superannuation fund? A different construction applied to the RSE members in TPS uh, because the potential to, we identified a, a problem that was if we made a compensation payment to them, then we could breach their contribution cap limits. And so we discovered that we would need to get a tax ruling um, in order to waive um, breaching the cap contribution. So whilst we identified a, a solution, we couldn't, so it was resolved that deal with the IDPS straight away and seek a tax ruling from the ATO 
as to the compensation uh, to the RSE TPS members. Now, I wonder whether you're getting confused. Was the tax ruling about paying compensation to the members or was the tax ruling about the consequence of using the ORFR to compensate the members? Uh, I, I'm, I'm unaware of that. You don't know what the tax ruling was about? For, from memory, my understanding of the tax ruling was that, that if we if we paid a, paid a compensation amount in, into a member's accounts, then, then we could be breaching the cap rule. That was my understanding. I'm not sure I really understand, though, why that explains why you needed to use the money received from the custodian to first pay the IDPS-like members. My, my recollection is that, that we were confronted with the dilemma that if we paid into the members' accounts, we would be in breach of the, the contribution caps limits. That's my understanding do you for, the, for the super fund. Do you say that you thought you had to delay or you could never... I'm sorry, I should withdraw that. Do you say that you thought at one point that it might be impossible for you to compensate the members of the superannuation fund? No, no, I, I'm saying that... that uh, my understanding was that if we were to pay the compensation to individual members' accounts in the superannuation fund, we might breach the, the contribution cap limits. That was my understanding. And therefore, we required a, a tax ruling. Now, let me show you a document which is tab nine to your statement, it's <coughs> IFL.0006.0003.4061. So this is a memorandum to go to the board on the 28th of October 2015. Yes. You see that? And yes. it's the board of Questor. Yes. And it explains in the background at the beginning that in October of 2012, Questor had reported a significant breach. You see that? Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot four zero six three. You see, this is an appendix explaining what's recommended for approval. Yes. And the first point is the payment of compensation to TRF, so that's the super fund members, impacted by the breach to the value of $2.775 million plus an accrued interest component. Yep. And then it says the compensation described above to be sourced from, and the first point is the remaining proceeds mm -hmm. of the settlement between the custodian and Questor. Yep. And the second one is the shortfall to be returned from the fund's general reserve being $1.616 million. Yes. And it says, note, Questor in its capacity as responsible entity of the TPS, IDPS-like product has fully compensated unit holders to the value of $392,000 utilising the NCS settlement Accordingly, this paper only deals with the TRF. Yep. So by this time, the settlement monies have already been used to fully repay the members of the IDPS like. Yes. And again, so that I can understand, do you say that had been done only because there was some doubt about the tax consequences of compensating the members of the superannuation fund. Yes, that was my understanding. Because on its face, what appears, or the, when the proposal is considered in full, what appears to be happening is this, that for the members of the IDPS-like product, where there is no trust funds of theirs available to compensate them, you have just used the settlement monies to compensate them. And then for the members of the superannuation fund, 
you have used whatever settlement monies were left over, plus the general reserve of the superannuation fund to compensate them. Do you agree? Yes. And in that way, it would avoid Questor, the entity, in its personal capacity, having to pay any compensation to the members. Yes. That's the effect of the proposal. Yes, it is. And was that the reason that the remediation of the members was framed in this way? No, the, the remediation, uh, the remediation uh, to the IDPS like what was done because it, it, there was no uh, tax impact and uh, my advice was on the investigation of, uh, of that, that tax group that there was a tax issue if we compensated uh, the TPS RSC members and therefore we would uh, seek an ATO ruling, which we did. And, uh, and they were subsequently compensated from the General Reserve. What was the general, ru general ruling about from the ATO? Well, uh, look, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't have a specific recollection. My understanding was that, that, that it would be a waiver for the purposes of uh, contribution caps for superannuation. Can we go to page dot four zero six five? So this is explaining sources of compensation. Mm -hmm. yep. And you'll see the compensation amount settled between Questor and NCS and passed on to TRF is considered acceptable on commercial and legal terms. Yes. And then you see four point two. The proposal was to use the ORFR yep. to compensate them. Yes. But the internal legal advice was that because the relevant operational risk didn't advise at the super fund level, the trustee couldn't use the ORFR to, compens to fund the compensation. Yes, I agree. And so then the next thing that was considered was insurance. Yes. And it was decided that the complexities of making a claim under the PI policy were quite great and in addition premiums in the future might rise. Yes. And that must be a professional indemnity claim against a policy taken out by Questor. Yes. That is a reflection of the fact that Questor may have negligently or in some other way giving, ri giving rise to liability have caused this problem to occur? No. How else could you make a claim against the professional indemnity policy for Questor uh, uh, unless sorry. it was because of a potential liability of Questor? Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Um, yeah, there was no negligence. So th there was uh, no possibility of making that claim. Well, that's not what the report says. It says the claim has complexities and the potential, and there's a potential effect on future premiums. Yes, I, that's, I'm giving you my answer. Oh, I see. Your view was there's no claim against Questor. Yeah. Well, well if, if it's not... If Questor isn't on itself negligent, then it's going to be hard-pressed to make a claim, is my proposition. I understand. And your view is Questor wasn't negligent? No. And then we see 4.4, general reserves. <coughs> yes. Management recommends that a portion of TPS's general reserve be used to top up the diluted distribution and therefore compensate TRF members. Yes. And if we go over the page, it is appropriate for Questor to utilise the general reserve in the circumstances described above as Questor has explored all other viable sources of compensation and the proposal accords with the TRF governing rules and reserves policy. Yes. Now, there's an obvious source of compensation that's not explored there, isn't there? Um, well, I guess the company could pay, yes. And do you know why no consideration was given to the company paying? Well, there was a reserve there which covers uh, uh, events such as these. So it was deemed appropriate to use the general reserve.
Is it an available point of view for me, Mr Kelleher, that the company was the uh, first and obvious source uh, to pay compensation? Or do you say that's not an available point of view? No, it's an available point of view, Commissioner. Tender that document, Commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry, that's already been exhibited. Already as well. Thank you, Commissioner, I apologise. Can we then bring up the actual minutes of the relevant meeting, which is IFL.0029.0001.26112? So these are the minutes of the Questor board meeting where the directors are to consider how they're to pay compensation. You see that? Uh, yes, I do. And you see 2.1, each director declared they did not have a conflict of interest in relation to any matters set down to be discussed at the meeting? Yes. Do you think that statement I'm sorry, do you think that it's true that none of the directors had a conflict of interest in relation to the question of compensating the members of the fund? I, I guess there, there are conflicts of interest in relation to every, every transaction and matter, so I, I think it's making a general expression. I'm sorry, M my question was, do you think it's true that the directors did not have a conflict of interest in relation to the matter of compensating the members of the superannuation fund? Uh, it's open to interpretation that there could have been a conflict. This is an issue that's been raised with IOOF by APRA, its failure to record conflicts of interest. The items that, that we, we talk with APRA in relation to conflicts of interest uh, are mentioned insofar as we're insufficiently explicit in identifying them. Does that mean the answer to my question is yes, that the failure to record conflicts of interest is a matter that has been raised with IOOF by APRA? Sorry, yes it is. That's an, uh, yeah. And this is an example of IOOF failing to record conflicts of interest? I'm not sure it's as simple as that. My answer is that, 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 that the conversations that we've had with APRA in relation to managing conflicts of interest is that, that we are not explicit enough. I think that's their words. So that's what I'm saying. Well, if you say there is no conflict of interest when there is a conflict of interest, do you regard that as being not sufficiently explicit about conflicts of interest, or is that an entirely different category with the of problem? With the benefit of hindsight, uh, I, I would agree with you. And then if we go to page.2615, this is where the decision of the board is resolved. Yes. And it says the board queried how ex-members would be remediated and the managing director, that's you, yes. advised there is a project being undertaken to identify the location of all ex-members which have been impacted. Yes. Do you know what happened with that project? Well, uh, prima facie, it was concluded and, and, and members were remediated. And how were they remediated? Um, they were written a letter. And, uh, what source of funds was used? Oh, sorry, the General Reserve was used. This is for TRF. I see. The General Reserve of yes. the Super Fund was yes. used in order to compensate ex members. Yes. I yes. see. And there doesn't seem to be recorded any consideration of the idea of using company funds to repay the members. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. And so what is resolved is that the compensation will come from the settlement that's been received from NCS and otherwise the general reserve yes. of the trust yes. fund. Yeah. And you agree the general reserve belongs to the members? It's not an asset of the members, no. 
it's an asset of the trust, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes it is. And aren't all the assets, don't all the assets of the trust belong to the members? That's not the way it's been put to me, but I'm, uh, I'm not a trust expert. Uh, the general reserve is, is not an asset of the members, is the distinction that's put to me. Who do you think it belongs to? The fund. You understand that Questor is a trustee yes. that holds assets on trust for the members. Yes. The assets of the fund are yes. held on trust by Questor yes. for the members. Yes. They belong to the members. Do you agree? Yes. The reserve is one part of the assets of the fund. It's, I don't think I'm qualified to answer the question. It's been put to me by our, our legal advice is that the, the, the general reserve is not an asset of the members. Well, qualified or not, Mr Kelleher, I would be very grateful if you would answer the question with your opinion. I will make of the opinion what I do, but what's your answer? My answer is that the, the general reserve is not a, an asset of the members. Commissioner. Now, you wrote to the members to tell them that there would be a compensation amount credited to them? Yes. And you've exhibited some of those letters? Yes, we have. And when you say we have, you have. It's your well, statement, yes? Yes, yes, I have. All right. Can we look at one of the letters you've exhibited, which is tab 11, IFL.0029.0001.1162? Well, that's coming up. Should the minutes of the Questor Board meeting 28 October 15, IFL 0029-0001-2611 be already, in exhibit. already exhibited? Thank you. Very well. So this is the, or a sample of the letter sent to a member? Uh, yes. And this is, I think in this case, it's a member of IDPS like. Um, yes. I think you can tell that from the use of TPS. Is that the portfolio service? No, the, the TPS is, is an acronym for the, the superannuation scheme. I think in any event, but you, yeah. your exhibit description says it's a letter to a TPS, IDPS-like member. Yes. Okay. And you'll see it says, following a periodic, periodic review of our CMA, we identified an historical distribution error that resulted in income being credited to your CMA at a lower rate than it should have been? Yes. That's not true, is it? Well, I guess it, it's silent as the time uh, that, the, that the review was undertaken, I guess, because at some point the, there had to be a review. I'm sorry. I, I think I understand your point. There are many ways in which this sentence are untr is untrue, perhaps if we work through them. The first is that the identification of this issue followed a per periodic review of our CMA and your point is, I think, okay, it wasn't that we found it after a periodic review, but you're saying we do many periodic reviews, so. It, it's capable of reference to that. It, I, it, I guess at the end of the day, our, uh, our arch ambition was to compensate and, uh, and that we did. In terms of your arch ambition, is it also an ambition to be truthful with your members? Yes. All right. Yes. So then you see it says, we identified an historical distribution error that resulted in income being credited to your CMA at a lower rate than it should have been? Yes. That's not true, is it? Well, 
Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I think we're, if we were making lower distributions, that would be income credited at a lower rate. You made a deliberate decision to reduce the distribution. Do you agree? Yes. It wasn't an error. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, it wasn't an error. I, I guess the, the reference to error is, is error that, that caused the need to do it. So. Oh, I see. You think the historical distribution error that's being referred to there is the original error of over-distributing? I grant you that, that uh, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not precise. By not precise, would you be prepared to accept that it is misleading? Yes, it's, it's capable of being misleading. And then if we look at tab 12 to your statement, which is IFL.0029.0001.1164, So this should be based on the exhibits, the description of the exhibits in your statement, the letter that was sent to members of the fund. Yep. And you see the same yes. type of statement. Yes. We identified a historical distribution error in an underlying investment of the CMA that resulted in income distributions being credited to your CMA at a lower rate than it should have been. Yes. And again, do you agree with me this statement is misleading? Yes, it's, it's potentially capable of, uh, of misleading. Is that a matter of concern to you as the managing director of IOOF? Yeah, on, on, on subsequent inspection, yes. But I'm not sure what turns on it. And then if we go to tab 18... Right, what do you mean by your last answer, Mr Keller? I'm not sure what turns on it. Well, I... Commissioner, Are you saying it's a matter of indifference, a matter of no importance? Is that what I'm to take away from that comment? No, no, Commissioner, it's a, it's a, a reference to our, our primary goal of restoring the member's account uh, and uh, with interest, and, and that was the uh, ambition. So the, the letters, uh, uh, when we read them with uh, hindsight, could be more accurate, but... That's what I would say. Yes. Can we go to tab 18 of Mr Kelleher's statement? That's IFL.0006.0003.4087. This is a letter from APRA to the directors of Questor. Yes. And you'll see it refers to some earlier correspondence that had been occurring in the middle of 2016. Yes. APRA was dissatisfied with Questor's approach to its duties as a trustee. Yes. And if we go to page two of the document, dot 4088, we see about halfway down the page in APRA's view, an RSE licensee acting in members' interests would not have allowed for remediation which sought to disadvantage unaffected members. APRA expects that an RSE licensee acting in members' interests would hold the party who caused any error or loss accountable and ensure that members were not unfairly affected by any actions to remediate such errors or losses. Yes. And Then if we go over the page to page dot four zero eight nine. We see that APRA set out its expectations under the heading conclusion as to what Questor would do acting in the best interests of the Superfund members. Yes. And the first thing that it said it would expect to be done would be to immediately replenish the super funds general reserves utilising funds from Questor as responsible entity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what it was effectively requiring Questor to do 
was to use its own funds now to pay for the compensation that had been paid to members. Do you agree? Yes. And you responded to that letter? Uh, yes. And if we bring up IFL.0006.0003.4093. This is a letter from 19 April 2017, that is last year. Yes. And if we go to the last page, which is dot four zero nine seven, see you are the signatory to this letter. Oh yes, yes. And so, at least by this time, you must have been fully immersed in dealing with this issue. Um, well, I'm not sure about fully immersed. I was dealing with this issue. Yes. You were dealing with APRA on a number of fronts. Um, yes, I mean, if we deal with APRA uh, daily, you know, it's, they're our regulator. If we go to page dot four zero nine three, which is the first page, we see the position that you sought to adopt. We see this in the paragraph beginning halfway down the page, which is that APRA might take. Yes. And you say, giving priority to the interests of the members of the super fund does not mean that Questor can or should ignore the interests of the beneficiaries of the cash management trust. It has fiduciary obligations in respect of both funds. And then you assert Questor as RSE licensee has had an unblemished regulatory history over many years, correctly balancing these competing interests. Yes. Is it still your view that the exercise that Questor has to undertake in a situation like this is to balance the interests of members of the fund against the interests of members of managed investment schemes of which it is responsible entity? Um, yeah, yes, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult uh, task and, and uh, it's a task of, uh, of balancing, yes. The problem is, can I suggest that the trustee has a statutory obligation to always prefer the interests of the beneficiaries of the super fund? In, 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 for, in so far as TRF is concerned, uh, the, the, the super fund? Yes. Yes. So there's no balancing that can go on. Well, it you was... have to prefer the interests of the beneficiaries of the super fund. The, 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 the proposition states, how does one balance one's fiduciary obligations against that statutory obligation? I guess uh, I'm probably not qualified to, to land, but that, the, the, it was interpretive. What was interpretive? Well, balancing a, a statutory obligation with a fiduciary ob obligation. If we go to page dot four zero nine four, which is page two of the letter. You see about three quarters of the way down the page, you say, we can confirm that the following options were offered by the responsible entity to the rectification committee for consideration on behalf of the RSE licensee. Option one, the responsible entity could claw back the over-distribution in the next distribution after the error was identified and confirmed in 2012. Or option two, the responsible entity could claw back the over-distribution over a period of time. Yes. And then it said option two was ultimately selected by the RSE licensee. Yep. Is there any part of that, of those statements that I've just read out that you would say are true? Yes. Do you say that in 2011, the Questor came to the Rectification Committee 
on behalf of Questor as the trustee and offered two options as to how it would claw back an over-distribution. Sure, I can't see the text under the, the highlight, but I'm not sure we said that at that at, in, in 2011. No, that didn't happen, did it? No, but I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, that we put that as a date option. I can't take see out the, uh, pop out and pop out the whole of the section beneath the RSEL's options. No, I, I'm, I'm standing by those words. When do you say that the rectification con committee considered on behalf of Questor as trustee of the super fund those two options? Well, I don't think it's explicit, but, but obviously shortly, uh, as soon as it became aware. I don't understand. Remember, we've already agreed the reduction in the distributions mm -hmm. to try to make up the over-distribution yes. began in September of 2011. Yes. And remember we've seen the whistleblower report yes. and the investigation into the whistleblower report and there doesn't seem to have been any documentation of the decision to reduce the distribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yes. And you haven't seen any documentation of the decision to reduce the distribution? No, I haven't. And you haven't seen a decision of a rectification committee where the rectification committee agrees to reduce the distribution over three years rather than immediately? No, no, I haven't. So when you said these things to APRA, what was the basis of them? Well, I think these are, th these are time reference generally uh, after those dates. So the, I, I guess what I'm saying to you is that it's not referring to specific dates there. You are saying to APRA that there were two choices given to the RSE licensee, that the RSE licensee selected the second of those choices mm -hmm. and that that was the choice that was implemented. Yes. That didn't happen, did it? No, no, no it did. It did happen? Yeah, well, to, to, to my knowledge, that's what we did. No, 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 Mr. Keller. Started clawing back the overdistribution. That's right. In September 2011, Questor, as responsible entity, reduced the distribution. Yes. It was a decision made by some accounts team within Questor. Well, the the, the company was uh, was subsequently aware. The company was subsequently aware. Yeah. You mean the board was ultimately told about it? Yes. The board was ultimately told about it either at the end of 2012 or the beginning of 2013. Um, We've looked at the documents already. Probably 2012, yes. Well, remember the significant breach notice is given in October of 2012. Yes. And then after that, that's reported to the board. Yes. Do you say these paragraphs, these words that you have written and signed do not mean that a decision was made by Questor as trustee of the super fund to reduce the distribution over three years? Questor as trustee of the super fund didn't make that decision, no. So when you say option two was ultimately selected by the RSE licensee, mm -hmm. which can only be Questor as trustee of the super fund, because that is the capacity in which it is RSE licensee. How is that statement true? Well, I, I guess we're merging the, merging the roles of the RE and the RSE, maybe. Now, I don't understand how you can possibly make that statement, given that the other part of what you have written is the following options were offered by the responsible entity, which is also Questor, mm -hmm. to the rectification committee for consideration on behalf of the RSE licensee, which is Questor as trustee of the fund. Yes. You don't blur the roles, you distinguish between them. Yes. 
do you want to offer any other explanation as to how what you have written is true? Well, I say that the import of what we were doing was, uh, was as, I, as I pointed out, the import was to try and get the member back to whole. And, uh, is the answer to my question no? You cannot offer any explanation as to how what you have written. No, I be... can't offer. All right. And then you say, if we go over to page three of your letter, four zero nine five at the bottom. You say, because full compensation could not be obtained from the custodian, there would be a need to use the general reserve of either or both of the CMT and TPS super fund for members of the TPS super fund and beneficiaries of the CMT to be fully compensated. You see that? Um, are you going to highlight that? Or? It's at the very bottom of the page, oh, the, the under, last paragraph. Under, under two, the compensation plan? Yes. Yep. It says, in reaching its decision, it took into account the need. Yep. You see that? And then yep. it said, because full compensation could not be obtained from the custodian, there would be a need to use the general reserve of either or both of the CMT and TPS super fund for members of the TPS super fund and beneficiaries of the CMT to be fully compensated. Yes. Do you say that's something that Questor considered at some point in time? Yes. It considered using a general reserve of CMT to compensate members? Not the general reserve of the CMT. When it says the general reserve of either or both of the CMT and TPS <coughs> super fund, yes. you're now making the point that's not true. There was never consideration given to using a general reserve of the CMT. Well, Consideration was given to using either or, and, and sorry, I, I'm short circuiting. I'm saying that, that we used the general reserve of the super fund. Does the CMT have a general reserve? Not that I'm aware of, but I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't recall. In the course, are you able to explain how you could consider using the general reserve of the CMT if there is no general reserve of the CMT? Well, I probably couldn't, but, but I can't recall whether there is a, a general reserve for the CMT or not. Commissioner, could I ask one more question and then yes. we'll finish for lunch? Could you go to page five of your letter? Yes. So, you see in the last paragraph, you say, finally and most relevantly is the fact that at no time has Questor received any demands for compensation or complaint about its remediation and compensation plans from any member of the TPS super fund. Yes. In terms of the so-called pub test, yes. which in these circumstances is a proxy for members' best interests, yes. it is the board's view that the test has been passed. Yes. Sorry, Commissioner, I said I had one question. I actually have two. You're astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what I aim to do all the time, Commissioner, <laughs> as I think I've proven this week. Uh, in relation to the first sentence, you see that you say that at no time has Questor received any demands or complaints? Yes. Can I suggest it would be impossible for members to make a demand or a complaint because they didn't know what Questor was doing? Yes. And then you see you say, in terms of the so-called pub test, mm -hmm. which in these circumstances is a proxy for members' best interests, mm -hmm. what, what is the pub test for members' best interests? Institutions like ours are, are constantly being confronted with uh, community expectations. So therefore, we we try and imbue the operations of the group with, with the value with the expectations of the community. And at all times here, the, at the end of the day, the aspiration was to return the member to, to to his whole position and compensate him for the period outstanding. And and that's that's something that we did. And that's what people would resonate with. That's that's what they would want, and that's what they would expect. 
And uh, that's, that's the aspiration, and that's the import of the letter. Do you think the community might expect that Questor and IOOF would use its own funds to compensate members rather than using the members' funds in the form of an asset of the trust to purportedly compensate members? That, that's open to, uh, to consideration, but uh, as, uh, as a business that we operate, this is a relatively modest amount involved here. At the end of the day, we are frequently making contributions uh, from the company. I mean, we, we, we see that as our responsibility. Um, is that a convenient two fifteen. Thank you, Commissioner. You'd be good enough to be back here in time to commence at two fifteen, Mr. Kelleher. Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Mr. Kelleher, your pub test letter was reviewed by the Board of Directors of IWF Holdings? Um, I believe so. We bring up IFL.0028.0001.1890. I'm sorry, I think this is, these are the, is a board report for the April meeting, but the minutes of the meeting are at IFL.0028.0001.0656. This is a uh, minutes of the meeting of the Board of Directors of IWF on the 26th of April 2017. Yes. I take it this would have begun life as the handwritten notes of the company secretary? I presume so. And then if we go to the fourth page of that document. We see the third bullet point down, Questor CMT the board noted our letter on this matter and that we should continue to press our position. Yes. And we understand the letter that's referred to there must be the letter that you sent on the 19th of April 2017. Does that sound right? Yeah. Maybe I need to see that letter. That was the one we were looking at before the pub yeah, is that, test. Yeah, if that's the one I made it before lunch, yes. The pub test letter. Yes, yes. All right. So the, the board knew about it and they were happy with that? I'm not, I'm, they knew about it. I can't form a view about what they said. Well, they said you should continue to press the position. Yes. And you're on the board. Yes. So you knew what the board thinks. Well, the, the board knew the letter and, uh, and they were comfortable with the letter. And then there was some further correspondence from APRA about this. Yes. APRA... I think wrote to you in August of 2017. Oh, I'm sorry, I attend to those minutes, Commissioner. Uh, minutes of the meeting of IWF Holdings Limited Board, 26 April 17, IFL 0028 001 0656, Exhibit 5.123. And then if we ring up IFL 0006 0003 3953. And you probably recall this letter? Yes, I'm just, uh, if I might read it for a moment. I guess. And we can go through it, but do you recall APRA tried to explain to you, that is to IWF, that you didn't understand how section 52 2D and 52 capital A 2D of the CIS Act worked. Yes. And they said you don't get to engage in this balancing exercise. Yes. You have to just always preference the interests of the Superfund members. Yes. 
And did you agree with that after you received this letter? Um, I'm not sure it was within our domain to agree with it or otherwise. I don't know. Well, you'd previously expressed the view that you were engaged in some balancing exercise mm -hmm. and you were being told there's no balancing exercise, you must always preference the interests of the members of the super fund. Well, yeah, I guess we, uh, uh, at the end of the day, we accept that, that uh, APRA's position is final. I see. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Uh, letter APRA to IOOF, 15 August 17, IFL. 0006, 0003, 3953, Exhibit 5.124. And so, did you agree to replenish the reserve with company funds? No, no, we did not. All right, so when you say you agreed that APRA's position was final, I'm not sure I understand what that means. Well, uh, we accept at the end of the day that, that APRA provides the licence. I guess our view was, uh, and you know, this was uh, a view discussed and developed with our lawyers, that, that, that um, there was a, an interpretive piece about which prevails in the, going back to this concept of balancing. Um, and when you've repeatedly given evidence throughout today, mm -hmm. Yes. that in the end the most important thing was to fully compensate the members. Yes. And by that I understand you to mean to make the members whole. Yes. You haven't done that, have you? Yes, we have. You've used the members' money, which is the reserve, to pay the members. No, we've used the general reserve to compensate the members. And the general reserve belongs to the members? No, that's not my understanding. And what you could have done was to instead use your money, the company's money, to actually properly make the members whole. Yeah, that's an alternative, yes. And to restore the reserve. Um, that's an alternative. But you haven't done that? No, we haven't. And can I suggest to you you haven't done that because you continue to be, as Questor originally, in breach of your duties to the members to act in the best interests of the members. No, no, I believe we acted in the interests of the, the best interests of the members. Now, this issue of using the reserve has arisen on some other occasions as well? Uh, you'll need to be more specific. All right. There was an issue in relation to pursuit where you used the reserve to compensate members. There was a pursuit distribution reinvestment error. Do you um, recall that? No, no, I don't, but... but I'll, br I'll bring that up. Yes. Can we bring up IFL. Triple seven dot triple zero one. I'm sorry, IFL dot triple zero seven dot triple zero one dot three nine four two. So this is the board papers for a meeting of IML. Yes. And IML, I take it, when it meets, it meets in all of its capacities doesn't have a separate meeting where it's the trustee and a separate meeting where it's the RE of one managed investment scheme? It, it, has, two, um, it has two roles. One, one is uh, RSE and the other is RE. It turns its mind separately to either item. If we go to IFL.0007.0001.4053. So this is a memorandum concerning an issue about the pursuit. I'm sorry, you might be able to see this more easily if we go to the appendix, if we go to 4055. <clears throat> so this is something called the pursuit distribution reinvestment error. Yes. And 
there's some references here to the trustee of the superannuation fund yes. and also to the operator. Yes. They are all the same entity. Trustee and the operator, yes. Imel is both the trustee of the superannuation fund and also the operator of Pursuit Investment Services. Yes. And you'll see what the board was asked to, to approve in relation to a particular issue, which is explained in the background. You can see heading two background. Yes. And the second bullet point is in August 2014, it was identified that distribution transactions entered and backdated to the previous month in the Orion administration system remained invested in the cash account rather than being reinvested in the relevant managed investment in accordance with the client's existing instructions. Yes. That seems to be an error of the operator. Do you agree? Yes. yes. And what the board was asked to approve was that the IDPS clients, so that is the people who were invested in the investor directed portfolio service yes. would be paid compensation funded by the operator. Yes. And that's funded by IML itself. Yes. There's no reserve available that belongs to those members to pay them. No. And what the members of the superannuation fund would be paid with was money funded from the operational risk financial reserve. Yes. And that reserve is an asset of the superannuation trust? Yes. And I'm not sure if we're now going to disagree about this, but an asset of the superannuation trust belongs to the members? That, that's not my understanding. And so rather than using company funds to pay the members of the superannuation fund who had suffered loss as a result of Imel's er error, Imel was going to use the ORFR from the trust, yes? Yes. And it did so? I believe so, but you'd need to keep scrolling through the pages. I'm not... This is the appendix seeking the approval. Mm -hmm. You'd need to scroll over the page. Well, we'd need to look at the minutes, which we can bring up in a moment. You don't recall what the outcome of it was. Yeah, pff, there, are, there are lots of meetings, lots of transactions. So does it surprise you? Me. It, I'm sorry, it doesn't surprise you at all that the recommendation in this case would be to use the ORFR to compensate the trust fund members? That's the function of it. To compensate the members of the superannuation fund for an error made by Imel in its capacity as, error, as operator? Um. Well, I think in, all, in its capacity, I guess that's an interpretation. Does it seem surprising to you that Imel as operator would have to directly compensate the members who are invested in the IDPS, but Imel wouldn't also have to directly compensate the members of the superannuation fund? Well, I think it goes back to your proposition that, that there is no RFR for an IDPS scheme than there is for, uh, for the superannuation scheme. Your point is, if it was possible to find some other source of money to pay back the IDPS members, we also wouldn't use company funds to do that. If there is, a, if there is an ORF set up for this purpose, then it would be utilised. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Just the memorandum, is it? Uh, Could we... For the board pack. Tender the the board pack, Commissioner, and then board I'll... Board papers, uh, Imel for meeting of 27 May 15, IFL 0007, 0001, 3942, exhibit 5.125. And then just to make good on the proposition as to what ultimately occurred, can we bring up IFL.0007.0001.3101? <coughs> So this is part of the board pack from the meeting of August 2015, but if we go to dot 3103.
We have the minutes of the meeting on the 27th of May 2015. You see that there, Mr Kelleher? Yep. And then if we go to page 8 of that document, which is dot 3108. You see item 4.2, pursuit redistribution breach. Yep. And you see what's summarised there. The board noted the paper. The board noted the summary of the breach and its impact. Yes. The proposed remediation strategy and source of compensation and additional controls have been put in place to prevent similar errors in the future. Resolved to approve the remediation strategy and source of compensation. Yes, that's correct. Now, do you think there's a conflict of interest involved in this decision? No, no I don't. I, I, we have a, a reserve, the super fund, uh, the IDPS doesn't. And so, If we go to page dot 3103, We see conflict of interest. Each director declared they did not have a conflict of interest in relation to any matters set down to be discussed at the meeting. And certainly from your perspective, that's unsurprising. No. You don't see any conflict involved here. Again, because it's being recorded, you'll need to answer oh, sorry, rather than I've, shaking your head. Sorry, no. You don't see any conflict of interest. No. If we go to page dot three one zero nine. Do minutes of board meetings, as a matter of practice, get signed in uh, email? Yes, normally they do, I my, my understanding. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Minutes of the board of Emil, 27 May uh, 15, AFL 0007, 0001, 3101, Exhibit 5.126. And there was also a similar issue that another issue of the same type that arose with respect to Questor. We'll bring up that document. Can we bring up IFL.0027.0002.0705? Sorry, no. Z .0705. So this is the board pack for a meeting of Questor yes. in May of 2015. Yes. So about the same time as the pursuit redistribution error. Yes. And if we go to page dot zero seven five zero. We see this is an appendix explaining a remediation proposal in relation to another error called the TPS regular investment sweep breach. Yes. And if you look at the fourth, the third dot point down, you'll see the explanation of what occurred, which is that, I'm sorry, the third dot point down under background. From the 30th of September 2011, the transfer was completed for those clients who were to transfer to a comparable multi-mix trust. However, Questor failed to reinstate the regular investment sweep instructions previously in place for these clients while they are invested in the United Funds. Yes. And you understand, which this brings back a recollection for you, the consequence of not reinstating the sweep was that there was loss to the clients. Yes. <laughs> and the remediation proposal was that the operator and in this case, that's Questor, mm -hmm. would pay compensation to the IDPS members. Yes. But the members of the superannuation fund would be reimbursed using the ORFR. Yes. And I'd suggest to you again, that means reimbursed using their own money. But you disagree with that? No, there's a, res there's a reserve there for this purpose. And I tender that document. Uh, board papers, Questor, 27 May 15, AFL 0027-0002-0705, Exhibit 5.127. And just to show that that was also approved, can we bring up AFL.0027.0002.0001? And 
and you'll see this is the board pack for the meeting on the 26th of August 2015. But if we go to page two, we'll see the minutes of the meeting on the 27th of May 2015. You see that there? Yes. And then if we go to page four, which is dot triple zero four. see at the bottom of the page that the resolution of the board was to support the remediation strategy. Yep. Again, lest there be any doubt about this, if we go to page five, the minutes aren't signed. You can see that? Yes. If we go to page two, no conflicts of interest are declared. No. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Minutes of Questor 27 May 15, AFL 0027 0002, Exhibit 5.128. Now, I want to show you another document, which is IFL.0006.0003.4075. This is a memorandum that was prepared by IOOF and we understand ultimately sent to APRA. Have you seen it before? Uh, yes. And if we go to page four of that document, ending in dot four zero seven eight. see paragraph 3.1.3 RE as set out in the background papers to the CMT issue Questor as RE did not maintain a sufficient level of oversight or a comprehensive governance framework do you see that yes I do do you accept that that was the case that Questor did not maintain a sufficient level of oversight or a comprehensive governance framework I'm not qualified to, to answer the first part of your, your question in terms of the, the technical piece of it. But perhaps if you might repeat that question again. We can take it in parts. Do yes. you accept that Questor as responsible entity did not maintain a sufficient level of oversight? I, I can't speak to that. I mean, I, it's not, I, I'm not sure how many people should be examining or, or not examining a transaction. You've never thought about that? Um, I don't actually understand the, the, whether it's electronic, whether it's digitised or... Yeah, so I've turned my mind to it, but... But, but you don't understand what the extent of the oversight was, is that your Yeah, point? whether it's physical, whether it's a, a maker checker, there, there are various mechanisms to, to review. And so it's not possible for you to form a view as to whether there was inadequate oversight? I can form a view, but, but how much help that is to you, I'm not sure. But, but it's not... My, what I'm saying to you is it's not my expertise, so... Did you at ever at any stage form a view as to the adequacy of oversight? Um, I don't think I concluded a view. I, I guess I inspected the, you know, I, I tried to understand what had transpired in relation to the, to the custodian breach, but, you know, as I said, it, it's not my expertise. All right, you considered it at some stage, but you didn't form a view. Is that a fair... Yeah, summary? I don't think I was qualified to form a view. I mean, you know, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, for example, you could say, well, more people should have been maker-checkers looking. I... But, you know... Attend to that document, Commissioner. Memorandum concerning conflicts and decision-making uh, map. Have we a date for it, Mr Hodge? Commissioner, I will have a date for it, but I don't have it immediately to hand. It was an attachment to an email sent to APRA. I now have a date for it. It was the 18th of August, 2016. August 2016, IFL 006 treble zero three four seven four zero seven five exhibit 5.129. Could we go back to a document we've already looked at, which is IFL.0006.0003.4061. <clears throat> you recall this is the board paper that we looked at earlier in relation to the Questor 
CMT over distribution error? Uh, yes. And if we go to page dot four zero six three. You see paragraph 2.2, .2, control environment. Questor's investigation yep. into the breach found that there was a control gap relating to the monitoring and review of investment performance and daily yields. Yes. Questor's investigation also highlighted the following. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's three points there, and if we go over the page. There's then a fourth point at the top, which is poor understanding of source documents and reports supplied by external parties and investigation of reconciling outstanding and excluded items. Yes. And these, can I suggest, are poor, uh, poor understandings on the part of Questor? Uh, yes. And then you see in the next part, in response, Questor has improved and then there's various internal controls that have apparently been improved by Questor. Yes, yes. I, I think that the, the import is that these are observations post the event. So when you're thinking about who should be liable mm -hmm. for uh, the loss, isn't that what you always do? Make observations post the event as to who is responsible? Uh, yes, that's correct. And having identified these various failings on the part of Questor, mm -hmm. did you consider whether Questor ought to personally compensate the members of the superannuation fund? Uh, yes. When? Well, on or about the... Well, I, I can't give you a specific date, but uh, to the question, did we consider? Yes, we did. But Did what, you minute it? No, no. But, but what we say is that, uh, that the, the fundamental area here was from the custodian. Uh, now, now, we've examined retrospectively uh, and form views subsequent, but you know, I think that's with the lens of hindsight. There was also an error, as has been identified, on the part of Questor. Do you agree? Um, look, yes, there's possibly a shortcoming there, but it's with the lens of hindsight, as I say. And so that I understand the full import of your evidence, can we bring up your statement and go to paragraph 52 of that statement? So this is IFL.9.0004.0028. And here you say in paragraph 52, Questor in its capacity as RSE licensee of the fund considered the possibility of seeking to recover losses from Questor as responsible entity of the CMT and from IOOF Service Co. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And so that we understand your evidence, your evidence is that at some, at some stage, you and the other directors of Questor, on behalf of Questor as the trustee, considered what suing yourselves, that is suing Questor, but as responsible entity of the CMT? No, no we didn't. So when you say in paragraph 52, we considered this possibility of seeking to recover losses, what were you contemplating? We were contemplating that, that uh, the entity that, that had caused the loss should, should uh, be responsible for it. You say Questor in its capacity as RSE licensee, meaning trustee yes. of the super fund, considered yes. the possibility of seeking to recover losses from, and this means from itself, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Um, yeah, effectively, yes. Do you have a distinct recollection now of at some stage having a consideration or discussion at board level as to whether Questor should recover from itself compensation for the members? I can't recall whether there was a discussion at, at, at board level, but it goes to the question of did Questor believe that, the, that, that it had caused the problem? And, and, and I say it did not. When did it even consider that question? Did it cause the problem? Well, I, I can't specifically point to a time in, uh, to my recollection, but it, 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 it says that it's comfortable that it did not cause the problem. Sorry, who said that? Questor. When has Questor said that? Well, 
that's what I'm saying. I can't recall the specific date. I'm, I'm saying the conclusion is that Questor does not believe that Questor caused the problem. You've seen the paper of the board mm -hmm. yep. where it's identified that there were failures on the part of Questor. I've, I've seen a discussion of that, and uh, it's with the lens of hindsight. As I said, when you look back at what goes on and you try and attribute reasons behind something that might have occurred, the fundamental root cause here was NAS, it was the, the, uh, the custodian. They caused the problem. Now, now we, we're saying, could we have done more? You can always do more. You can always improve. And the subsequent commentary goes to the, the question of what more could we do? And that's what you, you learn when, when, when an error is made, you, you learn. NAB thought it was only partly at fault? Yes. It thought that the other party with fault was Questor? Yes. That was why it only agreed to pay for half of the, of the compensation? I, I can't speak for, for NAB. Uh, I think uh, you'd have to speak to them. In any event, you knew that NAB thought that Questor was partly at fault? I thought that, that NAB thought we were a small, uh, a small counterparty and that uh, why, sh why, should we, uh, why should we compensate? I want to put these things to you squarely, Mr Kelleher. At no time has Questor ever properly displayed any understanding of its best interest duty to its members in relation to the Questor CMT issue. No, I don't agree with you. At no time has Questor ever displayed any proper understanding of its obligation to prioritise the interests of the members always and over the interests of Questor or any related entity to Questor. No, I don't agree. Even now, you do not see any problem with the events that have occurred in relation to this. I, I see a problem insofar as there was a uh, an overdistribution, um, and uh, at the end of the day, that overdistribution was compensated for members in full. Now, it wasn't compensated in full. You used the members' money to purportedly compensate them. You know that, don't you? No, they're your words. Have you ever looked at the financial statements for Questor? Um, yes. Have you looked at the financial statements for the superannuation fund? Not, not recently. Have you ever looked to see whether the reserve is an asset of the fund? Not specifically. If the reserve is an asset of the fund, do you accept that it belongs to members? No, it's an asset of the fund. No, I don't. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Oh. Mr Kelleher. Peters. No re-examination, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kelleher. You may step down. You're excused attendance. Commissioner, could we just adjourn for two minutes so that we can do a rotation of the parties in the Council? If I come back at, what, 10 to 3, is that going to be time enough? Shortly yes, after 10 yes. to 3? Thank you, Commissioner. Very well.